Um, second, learning about how Ohio currently criminalizes HIV. Um, third, uh, for all the case managers, you know, understanding what the legal requirements are under these, the current criminal code as to what a person living with HIV or AIDS would have to disclose to a, to a partner prior to sexual conduct. Um, and then, you know, in, in kind of contextualizing this for us, um, we're, I'm going to be highlighting sort of the problematic areas of, of Ohio's current laws. And we'll be talking about it's sort of setting up what Kim already referenced, uh, the March webinar, which will be um, this movement to modernize Ohio's criminal code. Uh, so that's where we're going today. Uh, Bryant, you can lead us off here. Hi, my name is Brian Jones. Uh, and I'm going into my 38th year with thriving with AIDS. <laughs> uh, we've been doing this work for a while. So, uh, but uh, just to get started, just to give people some background information, AIDS is the virus, uh, HIV is the virus that can lead to AIDS. And AIDS is the progression, the progressive condition. And many times people consider this to be the final stage. Sometimes you can receive an AIDS diagnosis and you can have immune rebound. Uh, such as myself, uh, where you your immune system rebounds well with the medication, and you become under, you can still become undetectable. Uh, AIDS-related conditions mean symptoms of illnesses related to HIV infection, including AIDS-related complexes, uh, as well as other cancers uh, like skin cancer, Kaposi's sarcoma, or Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and these related complexes, um, they can be confirmed by HIV tests. Um, if you should uh, receive, have an opportunistic infection. Uh, PLWHA means people living with HIV and AIDS. So uh, next slide. Now, how is HIV transmitted? The transmission, transmission of HIV, HIV can only happen in three ways, blood to blood products, intimate sexual contact and vertical transmission, which we don't see that much of anymore. Vertical transmission is mother to child. At one time, that was a problem. Uh, that's why it's important for women who are pregnant to be in prenatal care, because we still see these cases taking place if a mother is not in prenatal care. So if that's important. Also, we don't see, uh, IV drug use, those who inject drugs, is also uh, a way in which a person can contract HIV. We prefer to say contract HIV or transmit HIV as opposed to infected because the word infected is stigmatizing. And we also prefer to say people living with HIV and AIDS because we're more than just our status. So next slide. Oh, also, AIDS can't be transmitted. HIV is the virus that's transmitted. AIDS is the progressive condition or symptom of HIV. Now, the basic science, the body of evidence to date has established that there is effectively no risk of, of sexually transmitting HIV when the partner living with HIV has a durable, undetected viral load. This is called U equals U, and there are several studies that substantiate this. If a person has what we say is two or more tests of, of undetectable viral load, the science is clear. It's zero risk in, in transmitting the virus to their sexual partners. Now, we all know that there are other STIs out there, but as it relates to HIV and the U equals U movement is a feel good moment for people living with HIV. It changes the way we feel about ourselves as well as changes the way uh, the public perceives us. Um, punishes behavior that pose no risk or negli negligible risk of HIV transmission. These laws are based on uh, old information. They're based on fear. Um, it, originally it was, it was thought to protect the public but there's no studies or, or information or data to substantiate that. Um, and also these laws doesn't account for reasonable prevention steps taken by people living with HIV, such as the use of a condom. And we always already talked about U equals U, a person being on uh, therapy, uh, treatment. Uh, could you go back to that, please? Okay. Um, 
Now, even the low risk sexual behaviors uh, still does not stop one from being uh, prosecuted because these laws are specifically about not disclosing your status. Most of the uh, uh, cases are not about transmission. I understand it's not about transmitting HIV to your sexual partner. It's simply because you did not disclose. Also, if two people living with HIV uh, and I disclose to you, but you don't disclose to me, and there is absolutely no risk because we both uh, already have contracted the virus, a person still can be prosecuted in this way. So uh, next slide. I think I'm out of here. Uh, Emily? Yep, thank you, Brian. Okay, so now I'm going to thank you for that introduction and sort of contextualizing, um, you know, the subject matter uh, that we're talking about here, Brian. Um, and so now I'm going to take over for a few slides and uh, talk about uh, how Ohio currently criminalizes HIV status. Um, there are six specific laws in Ohio um, that, that so criminalize. Um, and it looks like the top one kind of cut off there, but the top one is uh, felonious assault, which, which I'll start with. Then there are th uh, three different three different laws in the Ohio Criminal Code that have to do with um, sex work, uh, prostitution, solicitation, and loitering. Uh, and then lastly, the last two laws here are um, selling or donating blood while being HIV positive, um, and just and then harassment with bodily substances, which I'll get to later. Um, Brian kind of touched on this, but but these laws were passed in you know the 80s and 90s uh, during during sort of the HIV panic that was you know going through the country. Um, these laws were based based in fear. Um, they're based on old information and just old science, um, and 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 that's why we're we're advocating for them to be up um, modernized because they are fundamentally unjust. Um, Ohio's law was passed in 1999. The very first state to pass such laws uh, was Tennessee in, let's see, 1986. Uh, Ohio's law was passed in 1999. There are currently 34 states in, in the US that have sort of um, HIV status criminal offenses on the books. Uh, next slide, please, James. Okay, so I mentioned, um, uh, the, the kind of, well, they're all big. There's, there's again, there's six laws on the books in Ohio that criminalize HIV status. Uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is felonious assault. Um, this is where I'm gonna read you. It says, um, no person with knowledge that they carry the virus, uh, that they have sexual conduct with another without disclosing their status. Um, and I, I want to be clear here, we've, we've had questions in the past about sexual conduct versus sexual contact. Uh, they are, in fact, those are two different defined terms in, in the criminal code. And um, from a legal perspective, when you have defined terms, I mean, you, you, you're not, you can't substitute one for the other. Um, so it is, to be clear, it's sexual conduct uh, without disclosing that is criminalized here uh, as felonious assault. Um, I will... There are kind of three three ways uh, a, a person can be said to have performed sexual conduct, and I will read the definition here so you can know what it's, it encompasses. Uh, sexual conduct means one, vaginal intercourse between a male and female, or two, anal intercourse, fellatio, or cunnilingus between persons regardless of their sex or gender, or three, uh, without the privilege to do so, the insertion, however slight, of any part of the body or any instrument, apparatus, or other subject into the vaginal or anal opening of another with knowledge that um, a person's um, bodily fluids might be on that instrument. Um, so I, I think I mentioned as part of this, uh, uh, the, the crime includes, you know, that you you do such a thing, you do, you perform such sexual conduct without disclosing. Um, and so that, that adequate disclosure and what constitutes adequate disclosure, we'll get to on a, on a later slide, uh, because actual disclosure is the only uh, affirmative defense that a person, should they be prosecuted under this statute, uh, proof that you have disclosed is the only way uh, to, avoid, to avoid conviction under the law. 
And it's a very onerous law um, to, if you are convicted under the statute, the penalty, uh, it's, it's an F2, it's a second degree felony, um, which means a person can be imprisoned for up to eight years, uh, two to eight years, but up to eight years per offense. Uh, and so, I mean, let's say you have, you know, this, this sexual conduct with another without disclosing multiple times. It doesn't all get, you know, with the same partner, it doesn't all get grouped together. Um, you can be charged for each time, you, you know, each sexual conduct for each act of sexual conduct uh, can be up to eight years. And those terms could be, could be, um, they're cumulative. So you wouldn't serve them together. So let's say, you know, you're, you're convicted under three charges of felonious assault, you know, three times eight, you could be looking at a maximum and, you know, 24 years perhaps. Um, and how we say it, it runs, it runs consecutively, not concurrently. So you can't serve, serve the time, you know, all at once for three charges. Uh, so, so very, very onerous pe criminal penalties there. Uh, next slide, please, James. Um, and, and here's where I want to mention, you know, I, I've mentioned sort of the basic definition for how one could be prosecuted uh, under the felonious assault law. Um, I want to emphasize here that the, the law does not require actual transmission of the virus, um, nor, nor does it require that the person, um, the, per the person with a positive status, that they intend to transmit the virus. Actual intent and actual transmission are not currently required under the law. Um, and as Brian mentioned earlier, uh, the, the law and, and possible, possible defenses, they also don't take into account any like risk reduction on the part of the person with the positive status. So, you know, the fact that you use condoms, um, the fact that the person might be on PrEP, um, which is the medication that, that reduces a person's viral load, so they basically can't in fact, transmit the virus. None of those risk reduction me measures are currently uh, taken into account um, in terms of a criminal prosecution of a person either. Next slide, please, James. Okay, so so like I said, the only currently the only affirmative defense a person can um, can raise to try to get out of of um, criminal conviction a federal felonious assault is proof that you ha you did in fact disclose your status prior to sexual conduct. Uh, well, so you might be wondering, uh, what does adequate disclosure entail? What, what's considered? Uh, this issue has in fact been brought in front of the courts uh, and the case there, I'm not gonna, I know this isn't a particular legal art, uh, audience here, so I'm not gonna get into the, to the super big details of the case. Um, but yeah, it came before uh, the appellate court here in Cincinnati, where I am, uh, in State versus Gonzalez. Uh, Gonzalez was charged with felonious assault uh, under under the state law, and the, basically the issue was: Did he adequately disclose his status prior to having uh, sexual conduct with at his time at the time his girlfriend? Um, you know, she claims no, he did not disclose. He he claims that he did in fact disclose. Um, there was no um, demonstrative proof of the disclosure. And by demonstrative proof, I mean like like um, um, you know a paper that you you know that, or screenshots or anything. Um, in this case, and, and it was back in two thousand three, uh, Gonzalez tried to establish that he disclosed by having people testify on his behalf. He had uh, an ex girlfriend, you know, a previous girlfriend. Um, you know, say, well, he disclosed to me and, you know, we always use condoms. So, you know, it's reasonable to think that he would have disclosed to, you know, this, this latest girlfriend. Um, he had his sister testify on his behalf. He had his case manager uh, also testify on his behalf. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, that was not enough. The court deemed, you know, these three witnesses uh, were not enough to prove actual disclosure. And so Gonzalez was convicted uh, and there were two charges. So he was uh, convicted and um, sentenced to uh, 16 years uh, in prison. Uh, and so the takeaway here is, uh, you know, this, the only defense, the only defense that's currently allowed uh, under, on, under Ohio's law is very difficult to prove. Um, and so next slide, Jane. Uh, I'd like to chime in on that particular uh, slide. Um, we know that 
the most important defense is a person can take uh, that partner to a doctor's appointment. Uh, doctors do have credibility. Those other things such as videos, screenshots, uh, or even if you're on a, a dating app and I disclose to you, or it's in my profile that I'm a person living with HIV, you still can't prove that the person actually read your profile. Also, the law says that a person that you disclose to has to be mentally capable of, of, of understanding what disclosure means. So therefore, if substance abuse is involved, that could, also, they could, that could also be argued that they weren't in their right capacity to understand. Whereas the law says that the person who is living with HIV, uh, the person that they disclose to must be mentally capable of understanding what disclosure means. It does not protect the person who is doing this disclosing because we sometimes, we know that sometimes mental health and HIV can run hand in hand. It doesn't protect the person living with HIV. So I just wanted to say that also that there's 34 states and two U US territories that have laws and 39 states have actually prosecuted under HIV specific laws or general laws such as attempted murder. Uh, also, seven states have modernized their law. At this point, we hope to be the eighth state. So, <laughs> great. Back to you, Emily. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, and that's sort of, I think, Brian provides a perfect caveat to to this this screen. Um, you know, what what, in my opinion, I'm a lawyer. You know, what kind of counts as adequate proof of disclosure. Um, these are just recommendations. And like, like Brian said, there are limitations. Um, uh, but you know, first, a, a possible way to, to establish that uh, a person has disclosed is you know, recording, recording yourself, uh, disclosing um, on, on audio or video, uh, that's time, you know, time stamped. Uh, second, you can, you know, get a get a, like a contract or just like a written a written disclosure drawn up and have have you both sign it and date it prior, you know, to establish the disclosure. Um, third possibility, like Brian said, you know, people are on the um, dating apps uh, or just you know text messages, uh, messenger services, saving screenshots of disclosures. Uh, and then the, the fourth fourth recommendation is or alternative uh, is you know requesting requesting your partner to accompany you to a doctor's appointment or an appointment with your caseworker where you know all three of you are in the room and you discuss you discuss the positive status uh, and then having that third party potentially as a witness again sh should the person um, uh, face prosecution under the law. Also, it's important that your doctor, make sure that your doctor documents it into your records in case your medical records may be requested. Sometimes uh, there are laws against that, but sometimes it happens where your medical records are requested and your doctor can say uh, with an affirmative that she can give a specific date, time as to when this disclosure took place. Great, thanks. Next slide, please, James. Okay, here I'm again. This is another uh, another case uh, that I'm not going to get into the details here. But some people ask, well, how is this how is this law with you know this required disclosure? You know, isn't that compelled speech, which would be um, potentially unconstitutional? You know, as violating the First Amendment. Uh, that has been that has been argued and brought before the court and made it all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court, who ruled on the issue and and found that no, um, in this instance, any compelled speech is incidental, uh, and so so the law is constitutional. Next slide, please, James. And I'm noticing the time here. Um, Okay, so we, we have been kind of focused on, again, that first law, the felonious assault, assault uh, law in Ohio, uh, but I mentioned at the beginning there were a total of six different laws that criminalize status. Uh, here are, uh, in essence, the five other laws. Um, three of them are sex work related, uh, and then one is the, you know, the bodily fluids um, on a law enforcement officer, and then the donating organs uh, or blood. Um, I want to be clear, especially with the the sex work, you know, three statutes. Um, this is a status offense, in essence. It is if you are, um, you know, convicted or thought to be engaging in prostitution, solicitation, or loitering while having an HIV status. Um, 
the, 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 the charge can move from a misdemeanor up to a felony um, just because you did something while you had the HIV status. Uh, and, and let's be clear, you know, soliciting, loitering, uh, I think Brian has mentioned you know, loitering and sometimes people get charged with loitering or soliciting just because they're walking too close to the curb or, uh, you know, law enforcement finds them and holds them up and finds they just, they have a curious number of condoms and somehow that is indicative of solicitation. Uh, so, you know, again, just I'm emphasizing here um, the harshness of these, these statutes in, you know, uh, changing something from what could be a misdemeanor up to a felony just because you're doing this work um, uh, uh, while having a positive HIV status. I do want to add in that um, these laws, the government, they, they say that you have to disclose, but it doesn't make the environment safe for people living with HIV to disclose. There was one particular case in Texas where a woman disclosed to her husband and he stabbed and killed her. Uh, there's also personally, from a personal perspective, I've disclosed to people, had my car burnt up, I've disclosed, got hit over the head with a tire iron. So the government can't have it both ways. We're either gonna treat HIV or prosecute HIV. On the one hand, they say it's a manageable chronic condition, but when it comes to prosecuting us, they say we hand down a death sentence, which is that we can't have it both ways. Yep, thank you for that, Brian. Uh, next slide, please, James. Okay, and here's where, again, uh, to the caseworkers in the crowd, if you just, you know, if you want to sort of advise, you know, well, what should people do when, when if they are arrested or held up by law enforcement? Uh, first, the, the very big thing um, I always stress with folks is, uh, you know, law enforcement is not your friend uh, in, in this situation. Um, uh, you know, police officers, they are agents, they are the government, they are agents of the state. Uh, even if they, you know, they kind of seem chummy or they, they say things like, oh, well, hey, you know, just tell me this, I'm gonna, you know, I'm trying to make it easy for you, whatever. Um, no, uh, they are agents of the state, they are the government. Uh, you know, law enforcement is not your friend, no matter how chummy they, they try to get with a person. Um, and here, just on the slide, you can kind of see my general do's and don'ts, uh, for, sort of generally, if you're ever faced in, uh, and held up by law enforcement, uh, do ask for an attorney. You have a right to an attorney. Um, uh, ask for an attorney as soon as you can. Um, and you know, generally comply with law enforcement when being arrested. This kind of goes back to uh, the uh, one of the, the on the last slide, um, the harassment with bodily fluids. Uh, again, if you are a person with HIV, a positive status, uh, and I don't know, held up in some way where you spit or accidentally bite uh, a law enforcement officer, you can be charged with a separate crime uh, for, for doing so while HIV positive. Uh, so, you know, just generally comply with the law enforcement um, and then, you know, things not to do. Uh, do not disclose your status to law enforcement officers. No, do not do that. Uh, do not discuss with anybody the incident uh, other than your attorney. Do not sign anything without consulting with an attorney uh, and do not consult any medical tests, uh, especially before consulting with an attorney. So the main takeaway is ask for your attorney. You have a right to one uh, and they will advise you. <laughs> Next slide, James. Also, if you, if the police cannot make a deal with you. They don't have the, the authority to do that. If they say, we can, uh, we're can, we gonna make it a misdemeanor for you, it's up to the prosecutor to do that. So don't believe any deal that they say they're gonna make with you if you tell them this or admit to this or that. Great, great point, Brian. Um, here again, you know, I, I think my message here today is, you know, how onerous uh, uh, the current the current uh, laws are in Ohio. Um, you may have heard about, you know, an ability to get things off your record. Uh, you know, if if you're charged um, or convicted, you can get your record sealed. For instance, well, record sealing is a whole other process, and if, if anybody has questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but just generally, you can see on the slide um, many of these these uh, the. the the status, uh, the status crimes, uh, the six that we've been talking about, you, you in fact cannot get them sealed. Um, you can see the, the asterisks there are, unless the person is 
perhaps involved with trafficking, there are sort of separate separate rules for sealing a record if, if human trafficking is involved. Um, uh, and, and the importance here is if you can't seal these, these charges uh, or convictions off a person's record, that's gonna have lifelong uh, impacts on the person, you know, even after if they have to serve a sentence uh, or if, if they're on probation. Uh, that means that you know, if, you're, if they're applying for a job, they're trying to you know, get a better job, they're trying for maybe a more stable housing situation, uh, maybe even like later in life, uh, trying to get into a nursing home. Um, if, if these things come up on a person's background check, uh, well, right away, their status is outed, right, uh, which can have a huge ramifications. Uh, and then just, you know, just the fact that they're remaining on a record, um, uh, people can lose out on those employment and housing uh, opportunities. So lifelong, lifelong impacts here under the current criminal code in Ohio. And Next even if a person is found not guilty, say for instance, they go to court and they're found not guilty, that they did disclose, the damage is already done, uh, they've been persecuted in the media, There's, their status is out there, and so it still will have the same lifelong effect even if the person is found not guilty. Yes. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm nearing the end of my time here. Um, this slide just sort of encapsulates again all the problematic, all the problems that, that currently um, uh, exist in the current criminal code. Uh, uh, and sort of the reasons for why the Ohio Health Modernization Movement is trying uh, trying to modernize the laws. Uh, and that's, again, I'm just gonna, uh, we're not gonna get into those modernization efforts. That is in the, the March webinar. So I'm gonna just plug that one, put that on your calendar uh, where you can hear more about that. Uh, and next slide, please, James. Yeah, so if, if you are interested in any more information on what I've talked about and what Brian's talked about, we have a bunch of resources here. Um, the Ohio Health Modernization Movement has their own website. It's listed there. Uh, Equality Ohio, which, of course, I work for and our legal clinic at Equality Ohio. Uh, you know, if you have folks who, who need legal help, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, and then uh, some, some national community partners are also listed up there. I believe this slide is also going to be repeated at the end, uh, towards the end here, so you can, you can jot these down again. Uh, but at this time, I'm going to now turn it over to Naima, um, Naima O'Neill, who is going to uh, talk more about these, this, this, these topics from a case, uh, a case manager's perspective. So take it away, Naima. Hey, good afternoon. Um, so this is going to really be a candid conversation about what we should do as social workers, case managers to help our clients because this is their life. And if they get caught up in the HIV criminalization law, they could serve some huge time. So next slide. I think what needs to, we need to take a pause and observe our own biases at the beginning because we must realize that no matter how we feel about the person that we're serving, no matter how we view um, or not view some of the things that are being done, whether it is uh, sexual orientation, whether it is um, the inability to stay clean and sober, that's not our job. Our job is to serve them and to offer them ways and maybe suggest things that they might do, but that shouldn't hamper how we treat them because they are human beings. And again, we are there to serve them. Um, and so I don't know if you can see the slide because I think part of it got caught up, but we uh, systems don't maintain themselves we have to maintain systems, which means that we, in a paraphrasing, we need to make sure that when we come in to work every day, we leave our biases at the door and we treat everyone as a human being first and foremost. Um, and I, this is from um, Sonia Renee Taylor, but I think it's a good segue to what we're gonna talk about. Next slide. So our objectives, uh, and these are things that if you don't know, and I know that a lot of people, especially people uh, requesting services, every time they go, they have a different case manager. And so I think this speaks more to the agency that social workers or case managers uh, are currently working in. 
if you're new, then everything that is part of the objectives, knowing HIV, um, ins and outs, because believe it or not, 30 years into the plus, into the epidemic, and we still have people who don't even know the basics of what HIV stands for, what AIDS stands for, how it's transmitted. And I, I know this because I've heard people, um, people even testing positive don't know the basics. So if they don't know the basics, their parent, their family or parents don't know the basics, their community don't know the basics. And when you are out, uh, even though HIV is not a popular conversation, when you hear people saying something that is mis, uh, misinformation, you need to correct it. Because if they have it, then people in their community probably has it as well. And so in order to change the thinking, um, and not to have and to change the stigmatizing way people living with HIV are treated or misunderstood, then we need to, to do our due diligence to make sure that we're saying, hey, I'm not, that's not, you know, that's not the correct terminology. That's not the correct um, way to think about HIV. Here, let me give you some education. And even if you don't know, give them a pamphlet. Um, because we really need to change how we think about HIV. It is a, it is a manageable illness, but society still either dismisses it, thinking that it's, it, no, it's cured because no one's talking about it, or they still have uh, misinformation. Next slide. So some misconceptions is that you can't, uh, you cannot contract HIV from playing, working, touching, shaking a hand of someone, or giving them a hug. These are still misconceptions that exist today. Um, you can't uh, get it from closed mouth kissing. That's not a way, instead of saying spread, to share your virus. Um, and then the other thing is that water fountains, even though we don't use them now because of corona, uh, again, public uh, swimming pools because of Corona, but in terms of HIV and AIDS, this is not a way that the virus can be shared and still people have this misconception about how the virus is spread. So I said all this to say that you need to understand how the virus is, uh, is spread um, from one person to the next um, so that even when you're, you get new people, newly uh, newly acquired the virus and they know nothing. You need to be able to give them the information that they need, one, to feel better about going around their nieces, nephews, uh, and relatives, and workers, co-workers, but also to get them to um, get a handle on how they feel about the virus. Because it first starts with how you feel about being HIV positive. And then after that, you can start, so that's self-advocacy. And that's the first thing is, and being able to teach them or show them, not necessarily teach them, but show them how to disclose their status, who to disclose it to, and like they said earlier, never to the police. Next slide. Okay, so this slide, um, I put this in here because there's so much information that you need to know. And these are things, and I know some people will say, well, this ain't my job. This is not who I'm supposed to do. There's only a few things that I can do, so I'm just going to do the basics. You want, if you don't know your history, and I'm talking about HIV history now too, then you may be subject to repeating some of the things that happen. Um, the Denver Principles, and I'm going to let Brian expound on this, really was a, a group of men um, who got together who said no more. They were tired of how they were being treated. They were, um, they didn't want to be victims. They wanted to take responsibility for themselves and they were patients. They weren't helpless and they didn't need anyone to save them. They just needed a fair chance to be able to do some of the things, to live what they needed to do, and to be able to have access to health care. Brian, would you like to add to this? Uh, with the Denver Principles, like the statement she has there, it, it starts off by saying we condemn attempts to, to label us as victim, a term which implies defeat. And we are only occasionally a patient 
a term which implies passivity and dependent upon the care of others. We are people living with AIDS. This, this document went on to talk about how we have a right to participate in our, our health care and be on boards and legislative bodies that govern our lives. And lastly, it says we have a right to a healthy sex life. I know many people think that people living with HIV once receiving a diagnosis shouldn't be having sex. You'd be surprised how many people feel that. And also it said, we have a right to live and die in dignity. During the earlier years, people couldn't live in dignity and they still can't. And a lot of times people can't die in dignity. In the early years, the, the funeral homes wouldn't accept the bodies. And even now, once people are gone, people are still whispering uh, misinformation about them. Also, the Denver principles are important because as you do this work as case managers, it, it lets you know that it's not your job to handhold somebody's hand living with HIV. It's your job to allow them and empower them with information. So just as it's your responsibility to let them know that these laws do exist if they don't disclose, it also should be what you would want to do to let them know that they do have rights, that people live with HIV do have rights. And I prefer not to use the word disclose because disclose or disclosure is still stigmatizing because the definition of disclosure is new or secret information. We should be teaching people there's no shame in living with HIV. Your, your status should not have to be a secret. And what you do is by empowering them, letting them know that they have rights, we're gradually uh, leading people to acceptance. And once, uh, the way I got rid of stigma, and internal stigma was the greatest stigma, once you process that and move on, you have greater acceptance of your status, and therefore you become more responsible as, in terms of uh, how these laws might impact you. And so therefore, if you as a case manager understand that people need to gain acceptance because a lot of these uh, aid service organizations are, are very paternalistic. They feel like they know what's best for us. And that's not necessarily you as case managers, but if you're in a system that says that, allow people and make sure that your clients are actively participating in their own care and services instead of hand-holding ordering their medication for them allow them to 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 take ownership of this so that's it thanks uh naima so um i i know what brian said but again some social workers that's their job so in order to enable them call on the phone with them, do a conference call, show them how to order their medication, let them know when it's time for them to update and let them put that on their calendar so that you're not constantly chasing after them to make sure they're eligible for services, but they're saying, hey, Naima, I'm calling you. Uh, it's time for us to make an appointment. Um, again, every agency is different, but the agency can tell you what your job is. You can go the extra mile um, for your clients uh, if, in, if you choose to. But if you don't, just don't hand them a piece of paper saying, sign this. This is, is, is uh, talking about the felonious assault law. No, explain it to them and have them explain it to you. Have them explain certain questions to you to see if they understand. But you have to understand everything first before you don't. Because if you don't, the downside is that you can cause your clients to stumble because you don't have the information in case they get arrested or if they get arrested to tell them what to do and how to do it. Because I really do think that um, it, it's a partnership between the patient or client and the case manager or social worker. It's not the weighted either way because it is a person living with life, but you have to give them the tools to create a toolbox that they'll be able to function with or without you. Um, because at the end of the day, we all get paid to do this. If, if Ryan White funding was to go away tomorrow, we, I, I think that a lot of our patients and clients will fall through the cracks because we haven't armed them 
on how to do things. Now, if they choose not to do it, that's one thing. But if you haven't given them the tools, then whose responsibility is that? I think it's both weighted because a patient has to know that they have a right to ask. And then you have to be able to equip them the way that they need to be equipped to, to uh, live with HIV. Next slide. All right, so this is just a, a basic, and these cards are available, and they're always trying to update them through the Ohio modernization movement. So if you don't have them, there's resources at the end that was given in the middle. Find out. You don't have to know everything, but you do have to know where to get the resources to help your your patients. So I'm not saying that you have to know everything because you don't. And for some people who leave and don't stay, then this should be something that your agency has. And when you get the job, when they're training you or teaching you or however the procedure is, these ought to be resources that you're given. So if you don't have it at your agency, you should be asking. And then there's places that you could go to. Um, again, that was a list that was given that you can get the resources, put it in a folder. And this is what you do and this is what you have and give it to your patients or clients and explain it to them and tell them what they need to do in order to stay undetectable, in order to do this because they have a part in this and they have a great part. Now that U equals U is in existence, women can have children again. Um, people can have, a, well, okay, I do advocate for sex, I'm not gonna lie. But so people have an opportunity to be sexually active if they choose to. No one wants to live alone. No one wants to live a life where they feel that they can't be touched and hugged. These laws don't, are not based in science. They're not supported um, and they're unjust and they're unproductive because we're never going to get a handle on finding out who's positive and who's negative and then um, doing uh, whatever is needed to make sure that someone is, who's negative stays negative and someone who's positive lives a healthy life. We're not going to do it until we get rid of uh, the laws. And again, the webinar in March is going to talk about that more. Next slide. My last slide is of the states, and I'm sure that Brian talked about this earlier, um, but, and again, you don't have to know everything. And the reason that I put this slide in here is to show the, the level of different criminalization laws or book, stuff that's on the books that's used to prosecute people. Um, you don't have to know all of it, but you do have to know that if your client doesn't stay in the state that they say Ohio and they want to move to another state, you need to be able to tell them, hey, we need to, before you move, let's look at the state that you're moving to to see what laws exist on their books to kind of forewarn them that this is what they maybe need to look out for because so everybody's state is different. You can tell by the blues and the purples and the overlaps and the stripes that there are some states who have uh, tremendous laws like Ohio we're, and we're trying to modernize ours. But these are things that exist. Again, you don't have to know everything. Um, if people have questions about what they need at the end of the day, the takeaway points is that know your job. It's not just enough to make sure that people stay on their medication. It is not just enough to say, that I did the required paperwork. Um, this, you need to go above and beyond the call of duty to make sure that you've given the information that is needed and uh, very much, I, patients appreciate it when you take the time and just don't throw paperwork at them and say, okay, we done, see you in the next six months because you, you haven't done your job as a, a case manager. Next slide. I believe Brian um, is the next person that's going to be speaking. Am I? <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, so there's some general takeaways from here, like Naima said. She was pretty, she covered most, you know, mostly anything that a case manager can do. But I just want to drive home the point that Ohio 
is actively prosecuting people living with HIV. You may not hear about it because a lot of times what happens is people plea bargain. So you may not hear about it. Now, there are cases that do go to trial, and those are the ones that we actively hear about. But Ohio, know that Ohio is prosecuting. And you should have the Ohio Health Modernization Movement's number or contact information on speed dial because it makes all the difference in the world being able to, to reach out to those sources. Uh, and we may refer you to HIV law and policy, uh, particular cases in Ohio. One guy didn't reach out to us until the day before he was to be sentenced. He ended up getting five years. Somebody in Youngstown reached out when the, when the person was first detained. That person ended up getting probation. Although the cases were different, it just goes to show you that the sooner you jump on it and the more information you as case managers have, it could be the difference in your client serving a lot of time or possibly getting probation. So, and it's important for us to educate those people who are living with HIV, not to control them or have these control issues. Like Naima said, if you think this is just a job, then, then this may not be the space for you. And you've got to realize that you have to leave your biases and your prejudice at the door. Me being black, same gender loving, and Muslim, when I walk in, there's a lot of isms going on. A lot of uh, barriers come up. And as it relates to these laws, if you don't understand it, how can you get your client to understand it? That's about it. So are there any questions? I guess we're going to open it up for questions. Can yeah, I? We, oh, I'm sorry. Go Can ahead, I, Naima. I just wanted to add one thing, too, that if you, um, uh, it, he said that he was um, a male. I'm a female living with HIV. And so our issues may be different. If a woman says that uh, she's still of childbearing age and she wants to have children, give her the resources that she needs. Let her talk to her physician or talk to a doctor about it. Don't give advice because it, you may, your bi biases may come through. And so we don't want to do that. We don't want people to ever feel that uh, being HIV positive is a deterrent. We don't want people to feel that they're less than because they're positive um, or that their life is over or that there are certain things that they can't do. The world is the gamut regardless of whether you're living with HIV or not. Um, first, it, it, you have to see how you feel about living with HIV and then get the information that you need to help everybody else. Because it's not them. that You'd have had the issue with them. Uh, also, I want to say just because a person receives a, a positive diagnosis does not mean that they automatically know how to disclose or, or share their status because it's theirs to share. We need to get out of the mindset that just because you get a diagnosis and most people are not living with HIV say, oh, I would do this and I would do that. You never know what you're going to do unless you're faced with that situation. So don't assume that a person knows how to share their status. That's it. All right. Thank you, Brian and Naima mm -hmm. and Emily. We do have a couple of questions. Um, so Emily, this question is for you. When you were talking about um, not telling law enforcement or not sharing your HIV status with law enforcement. What about a situation where you have to take your medication? How do you go about asking for it without sharing your status? Um, great question. Uh, I guess first, uh, well, I, I can think of two scenarios. I mean, if they're, if they're arrested with their medications on them, you know, the medication is going to be seized by law enforcement. Um, and then I would, um, I think I would just, you know, tell law enforcement, hey, you have my meds, like I need to take my meds every day, you know, um, there. If your meds aren't on you, uh, you know, and you like, they're at home or whatever, um, uh, you know, again, my, my biggest piece of advice was, was ask for an attorney. And then, you know, once you, once you consult with your attorney, that should be like the very first thing, you know, hey, I have my meds at home, I need to get my meds. Um, I don't know if Naima and Brian had anything else to add there. What I do know is, as someone who's been incarcerated before, if you're, if you're detained for more than those 24 hours and you're, you've been booked in, prosecu uh, uh, processed in, 
the medical staff will review you right then at that's part of the process. And at that time, you still may not get your medication to that next day. But missing that day is not going to kill you and you should not let it stress you out. You'll be fine because that medical staff will make sure you get that medication. And that's why it's good to have case managers in the loop because they can also be a, a, a advocate on their behalf to call the, the, the county and make sure that their client is getting the medication. Because a lot of times it may take the nurse because they're going to call your hospital, your provider. And if you can help with that process, it just makes it go that much smoother. That's what I was going to say, Brian. And um, because a lot of facilities, I know the county has nurses, they have medical staff. I've never been to prison, so I don't know what they have. But the <laughs> same thing exists. So you don't want to be um, anxious just because you haven't taken your meds for that day. Um, let the system play out and see what's going to happen. You may get bailed out and you may not need to tell anybody. So you want to see what's going on. But you should always call <clears throat> the conversation that the social worker should have with each patient. It's if you ever get into any serious trouble, call me. If you, if you, because I may be able to have a resource and if I don't, I can find someone that can. Because a lot of times in the county, they, they give you tickets and you can't, you don't have to say anything to anybody else. Just write a ticket saying that you need to speak to a nurse or speak to a medical person and they will allow you to do that. So just don't get anxious. Don't share information that you don't need to share because you can't take it back once you've shared it. And not even with your the, the other, other inmates because word of mouth does travel and people are always looking for a come up. So it's best just to stay to yourself, keep your own issues to yourself and let that be. Like she said, let, this, let, it, let the process play out. Emily, do you, there's a, a follow-up question on that is what if they, if they so you, you're, you've had the medication on you, let's say, and it's been seized and law enforcement asks what the meds are for. I don't, I wouldn't answer the question. Um, you know, again, yeah, ask for a lawyer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I told you my big advice is you can ask for an attorney you want, and, and then you, know, uh, and you can you always can look, they can always look up the number of the pill that they really want to know. They already know else you wouldn't be there. <laughs> They're just trying to get you more statements to, 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 to go against you. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, then there was a question uh, with regards to, um, uh, I think this was kind of Naima's point about having your client, um, giving them power to do things and to know how to do things in a toolkit. Um, and the question was, um, what about how, do, if they can't really do those, maybe there's a mental health issue in the way. It, I mean, but it, what's important is that when you do that assessment of your client, the psychosocial and when you have a conversation with your client, you could pretty much know what they're able to do and you can always ask. So it's not like, but even with that, you can do stuff together. You don't necessarily have to give them, uh, you still give them the tools, but you still say that I'm here to assist you. I'm here to help you. Um, and if they're not capable of doing that, that means that that's more work that you need to do. But a lot of people can do some things um, maybe they feel like they can't, but after you've worked with them for a while, you can kind of figure out and, and kind of know what you need to help them with, what you don't need to help them with, and what you all can do together. And also, if they, if they do have those mental issues, write your contact information down, have them put it in their wallet and know that they have that. That's all they need. They don't need to talk about anything else. This is the compact person. Let that person handle it for you. Uh, and, and, and that's a security blanket for them. And then some agencies allow you to have, um, well, here we, we have a, a work cell phone. Not every agency does that. So what Brian said about doing, writing that down and giving it to the patient, but also if you do have ability to have a work phone, then I would say make sure that that patient knows your number and they know to contact you. And they also know to give that number to people as they need to, if they need some help. And so you're not giving up any information. You're giving it to the case manager to handle and you are in a sense representing 
that patient or client so that and it didn't make them feel secure that if they but run don't into give it to the police happens. though give it to well, the lawyer when the lawyer right comes. i got you <laughs> don't, he, she's right he's right Mention don't he's give it to the that. police don't right. give it to the police but your, your case manager the more educated they are they will know that well, you need to talk to his lawyer. Has he asked for a lawyer? And that's where the case manager can intervene and say, well, if he's asked for a lawyer, then you need to give him a lawyer. <laughs> Get him a lawyer. All right. Um, Emily, can you confirm for me, yes or no, because we're, run we're running close on time. If you don't know that, that you um, have the HIV um, virus, can you be prosecuted under these laws? No. Um, which is why that's part of the, the modernization effort. Um, the current, you know, the current statutory regime, it actually disincentivizes folks from getting tested, right? Because if you don't know, you can't be prosecuted. And that from a public policy standpoint, that's terrible. You know, we want people to, to take care of themselves, get tested, know their status, uh, and, and, you know, take care of their health. Uh, but so no is the short answer. But there was one guy in, in Akron who, who said he didn't know a status. The blood bank said that they told him, which is not the blood bank's job to tell you, is they're supposed to refer you to the county. These people got on the stand and testified and said that they told him when they gave the contact information, it was the wrong contact information, he was still given five years. Great, great point, Brian. Um, if, you know, of course, it's a defense if you don't know, but then it's going to be an issue. The prosecutor is going to try to show that you you did know. Uh, same with kind of same with you know what what counts as adequate disclosure, and you know you can show a screenshot, but like Brian said, the prosecutor is going to argue that person didn't read it or they were high as a kite when they read it, so they didn't comprehend it. I mean, you know, all of these things, you know, lawyers can argue anything, uh, and and they surely will. Um, so it's just a good point. All right. And we are running out of time, and I see Dolores has a couple of questions. Dolores, I will reach out to you. I will give the, your questions to Emily um, for her to respond to you and separately, because we are running out of time, but they are good questions. And I want to uh, thank everybody for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, Naima, Brian, and Emily. Thank you all much. The link to the Survey Monkey for the CEUs is in the chat, and we will hold this open a little bit longer so you can make sure you go grab that Survey Monkey. Thank you, everyone.